Thank you. So yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for sticking through to the end. I'll try not to run too long here. Um, so the talk today I'm, trying to, I'm going to give you is it's roughly titled The Perils of Software Engineering. Um, but let's first sort of cover a bit of who I am. You know, I'm a Django Core developer. Um, you know, as I said, I worked mostly on migrations, so south previously from 2008 till last year, and then the last year or so, Django's built-in migrations. Um, I work at Eventbrite. I'm on the architecture team, which is sort of like the internal make things scale and stuff work team, which is not our official name, but you get the idea. Um, and I'm also a private pilot. I do archery, and I have lots of other hobbies that are just too numerous to describe. Um, but what I'm here to talk about is perils. Now, I've gone around the conference, and I've hopefully talked to a few of you, and I hope to catch, talk to a few of you more at the end. But one thing I've seen is that quite a lot of people here are starting out, or so they're quite early on in their careers. And what I wanted to tell you is sort of my view of some of the things that can befall you that can go wrong in software engineering. Um, and we'll get to those in a minute, but first of all, I want to reinforce something. Computer science is not the same as software engineering. Now, my degree is in computer science. Like, that's, that's my official training. Um, but that's very different. Computer science is the science of computation. It's about analysis. It's about proving things are correct. It's about seeing if this is the, gives you the optimal solution always as an algorithm. Software engineering is something much more subtle. Software engineering is, like, like most engineering, partly art form, partly science, and sort of this much more difficult thing to describe. A software engineer isn't necessarily concerned with is this perfect? They're concerned with the trade-off of, is this good enough versus the time? You know, that, they can't spend 10 years developing something and getting it, getting it absolutely perfect. They have to ship something out the door. They have to iterate. They have to improve. And so what I want to show you is, like, what is engineering? And engineering is more than just software. Engineering is this big discipline. We have many, many more categories of engineering than I can even put on this slide. But they all kind of have one thing in common. Like engineering as a general profession is the meeting of like pure science and the practical real world. It's taking something technological or scientific and adapting it to fit a real world problem with limited time and limited money. And that's true of a lot of things. But let's see why software engineers have it real good. Mechanical engineers. I knew many mechanical engineers at university. Um, they had exciting labs, they had engines, they had explosions, they had, you know, they made small skateboards that power themselves. But you've got to remember that as a mechanical engineer, you're working with real things. They work with engines and metals and plastics. They bend, they break, they're brittle. And what this means is that it's non-deterministic. If you build a design and run it once, as a software engineer, it's going to work every time because computers are predictable. Give them the same input, you get the same output. In the real world, we have all this subtle random variation. So engineering in mechanics is, is non-deterministic. It's about building extra buffer in, having that little extra room of like, well, we'll have one millimeter tolerance. So the natural you know, temperature sizing of this metal is fine. Another thing is expensive. As a software engineer, you can just buy a laptop. And laptops, sure, are not particularly cheap compared to some people, uh, people's incomes. But think about what a mechanical engineer needs. They need a lathe, drills, a whole workshop probably. The raw materials themselves are costly. The training is expensive as well. You can't just teach yourself necessarily. And so you've got those two sort of combining things where like mechanical engineering is, you know, it's perhaps equivalent. Designing a good engine is kind of the same as designing a good program. But at the same time, it's much easier to get designed the program once and get it right, whereas mechanics, you have to just test and iterate. And like, you have to prove that in a wide variety of conditions, your stuff will work well. Civil engineering. Now, this is my favorite version of engineering. I'm not going in, I haven't gone into it for a good reason. And that's because it takes literally forever to build anything. There are, so let's say dam engineers, people who build giant dams around the world they will probably do two or three projects in their lifetime. When they start out, they'll work on one project. When they get to the middle of their career, 20 years later, there might be a second one. And there might be a senior consultant on, on the last one at the end of their career. Three things in an entire career, in 50, 60 years. Things just take a long time. Tunneling new railway lines takes a long time. 
For example, in London, we're building a thing called Crossrail, which is a brand new underground line. In here, here in Singapore, they're building new MRT lines. Those take years and years to dig out and build up and shore up. And not only that, if you make a small mistake, if that tunnel collapses, you've wasted years of work and millions and millions of dollars. So not only is it slow and difficult and expensive, but also you have to be really, really careful. You know, as a software programmer, if you make a small mistake and a bug happens, you can just rebuild it and compile it again. If a civil engineer makes a mistake, the dam's going to break or a tunnel will collapse. So you, know, you have it easy. But here's an interesting one. So software engineering isn't all easy. And the most difficult, I would say, arguably, is aerospace, the software that runs in aircraft and in spaceships. So you have avionics engineers. I've met a couple. They write software that, you know, modern planes have dis displays, they have software. That stuff has to be incredibly resilient and incredibly reliable. But again there, the cost of failure is very high. That's why a lot of spacecraft and aircraft have redundant systems, they have voting, they have all these safeguards in place to make sure that if the software fails, there's a backup. Every single autopilot system has a physical disable switch in the cockpit still. We still don't trust that code. And this is kind of part of the aerospace industry. Their attitude to failure, which is a very healthy one, is that not will this fail, it's when will this fail. They test everything to destruction. If you have a normal mechanical component of an aircraft, I can bet you that the manufacturer can tell you the mean time to failure, the average rate, the percentile ranges for that stuff, because that's the part of it. Similarly with the software, like, you know, they fuzz test it, they break it, and even then bugs come through. You know, quite recently there was a bug with, um, I think it was one of the new Airbus planes code, where pretty bad things happened. It could shut down in flight after being on for an exact number of days because it had a counter that would overflow, and then the plane would shut down in mid-flight. So not the best. But one of my favorite examples of, of, of an excellent software engineer is the woman who arguably, in fact, she invented the term software engineering. Um, this is Margaret Hamilton. She is standing next to a very large stack of paper. That very large stack of paper is the source code to this. Um, it's the source code to the Apollo program's landing module and also the command module. Um, Margaret was the lead programmer on that project. She was the one responsible for making sure that the software that drove these spacecraft got the astronauts in there to the moon and back without bugs. In particular, there were bugs. And because she was a sensible engineer, and in fact she invented many of the things we take for granted today in good software engineering, she built the software on the lunar module to have redundancies, to have a fallback. And in fact, she anticipated something that happened during descent. During the Apollo 11 lunar landing, which of course is very, very famous, what you probably don't know about is that during the landing, the computer overloaded. There was a mechanical fault with one of the radars, and it was causing too many messages to go into the computer. Now, bear in mind, the computer in this is way less powerful than even my watch 20, 10 years ago, right? It's an incredibly small thing. And having a few extra messages meant it just couldn't cope. And they, would almost, they, they were close to having to abort because the computer wasn't responding, it can't land itself, they couldn't have control of the, of, of the lunar module. The astronauts just didn't have the option. But what that software did is it had a fallback. Margaret has pro programmed in a system where if it overloaded, the computer would reboot, close off every non-essential system, and just keep the key flight systems. And because of that, it rebooted, came back online, they had to manually pilot it, but it was still possible, and they landed successfully, and the moon landing was possible. But it's that foresight, that high quality and caliber of engineering that made that possible. And that's not something you see a lot in what I will say is normal engineering. Most software engineers, myself included, write websites, we write mobile applications, we write things designed for people, you know, normal people running around. And while it's very quick, we can build and test and deploy and try again, you know, in my old company, Lanyard, we deployed five to six times a day, we ran tests every commit. You do have this problem where the quality is ne never quite as high as it could be. Um, again, as I said before, you have, you have minimal equipment costs. And even better than that, it's a very well-paying profession. Like, 
among engineering, and engineering is quite decent, like electronic, engineer, electronic engineering is quite good too, but software engineers are generally very well paid. It's a very nice profession. But let's think about sort of what's actually going on here. And, and well, to illustrate here, this is a DeLorean for a time machine stand-in. Um, I want to sort of take you through what I would tell myself when I was starting out 10, 15 years ago in the industry. Sort of like advice to my younger self, as it were. Now, the very key thing in the Zen of Python, like my favorite line of the Zen of Python, explicit is better than implicit. This is so much more wide ranging than I even initially gave it credit for. It sort of extends to all aspects of not only programming itself, but systems design and interface design. Um, one of the interesting things I particularly hate is code indirection. So, you know, here is a very basic example of a Django class based view. It has, if you look up here, there's a class, it inherits from one thing, self.render. Now, if I want to go and modify the render function, I know that this function is in there. No problems there. It's a very direct code path. I can just go and modify it. Let's throw in some mix ins. So, one of the things I often see junior developers do is go, well, we do this same thing everywhere, so we'll roll it into a mix in and just apply it to the class. And I'm not kidding, I have seen classes with over 10 things in this inheritance line, and then those things themselves have a couple more things. And at this point, where's render? It could be in any one of, let's see, that's at least you know, nine or 10 places. Not to mention, do you remember the method resolution order in Python? Do you even know it? Do you know which, which way Python will traverse through this tree of classes to find the render method? And so this is one of the things where, even though it may not be the perfect code, it may be slightly more verbose, it's very important to be explicit. Let's have a little, another example. This is kind of like one of the reasons I don't like certain async frameworks. So here is a standard way of reading a file. You know, I open a file, I write something to a socket, I increment a key in Redis, like three normal operations. Now, if this is normal Python, I know what's going on. If this is something like gevent, now gevent, for those that don't know, is called corruptive multitasking. And the key thing is it runs a single process. And while it looks like you have separate threads, what's really happening is that every single function is being called, it has to release control, that's what the corruptive part comes from, and then another function, we drive back to another function and keep going. In particular, what happens is generally things like socket writing or certain in libraries themselves will have that control release in there, but it has to be done explicitly. And so you come in a situation where if I come into this code, this Redis library, I don't know, is it, is it cooperative? Will it yield control? Because if, if this code isn't cooperative, and I leave this in here, my entire process will slow down. If something doesn't cooperate in a cooperative parallel environment, then nothing else gets run. And this is one of the problem, my, my problems with solutions like this. Like, I can't tell looking at this, is there a bug? I have to go and examine every single implementation of every single line and keep going back until I find and confirm that that is cooperative. And even then, an update to the library might come along and just ruin that aspect for it, especially if I'm monkey patching in that cooperation. And so, for example, AsyncIO, the Python 3 solution to having asynchronous um, sort of programming, it uses yield. And so you can see, well, is there a yield? Then yes, this is cooperative. It is a much more explicit way of saying this line will yield control. And even better, that means that you can say, well, these lines won't yield control. And so you know that those are implicitly like a transaction. They're, they're atomic. And so you can do things like, I can write to a variable and read to one here and know that I won't be interrupted while in between those. Like, whereas a normal threading in Python can just jump in any time and ruin that stuff. One of my personal, I guess, expertise areas is schemas. Um, those of you in my tutorial uh, a few days ago may have seen a bit of this, but implicit schemas are another thing where I don't like. So, you know, an explicit schema is like a normal MySQL Postgres database. You have columns, the columns have types. When you try and insert the wrong data, the database goes, no, you tried to insert a string into a number field, stop doing this. Whereas something like MongoDB, for example, will just take whatever you put into it. Here, weight is an integer. Here, 
weight is a string with kg on the end. Isn't that lovely? Here, I've misspelled name as nom. It doesn't care. It has no idea. Here, the weight is negative. It doesn't, it doesn't know about this. And each of these are different errors. And my code would have to deal with all those errors individually. Now, if you want to write that code, that's great. Go for it. But realize that every single time you're trading the convenience of this implicit schema, you are just pushing off future errors and future possibilities to yourself. Like, you're going to come back in a month, two months, three months' time, and suddenly you have numbers that are wrong. In fact, one of my favorite errors I ever had, um, I was doing a database of football pitches in the UK. A relatively simple data set, you might think. You know, well, we have every football pitch, and it has a latitude and longitude. Well, almost. Some of them had latitudes and longitudes as numbers. Some of them are strings. Some of them weren't that. They were what's called OS grid coordinates, which is a UK-specific coordinate system. Um, some of them weren't that. They were latitudes and longitudes, but without the decimal place and with five decimal places fixed in. And the end result of this was I tried cleaning it up and feeding it to Postgres. And Postgres is sensible. It has geographic types. You can say, hey, Postgres, this field is a point in latitude longer coordinates, WGS84, what we use for GPS. And if you try and give it a stupid value, Postgres will go no. And so I tried parsing these in. I tried decoding them as best as I could, passing them in. And it got most of the way through and then went, this doesn't make sense. And there were football pitches that were apparently off the top of the North Pole. Several of them were beyond Antarctica. Several of them had, had longitudes that were more than twice around the world. And it just, Postgres rightly went no. And it took a long time to take this data set and manually fix, I think there were 30 or 40 different error cases. And the problem was, the thing this was stored in beforehand didn't have schema checking. It was, it was a spreadsheet in that case. And so it's the importance of having that thing up front. It's a little bit of work now, and it saves you a lot of work in the future. And this is the kind of thing. Clever code is bad. Now, people I first meet who are junior get very confused by this, because I think, you know, well, Andrew, he's a, he's a senior developer. He obviously knows a lot of stuff. He writes very clever code. I'm like, no, I write very stupid code. Um, I think part of being a senior developer is writing very stupid but very obvious code, because you realize that you'll forget stuff in a year's time, and you'll come back and go, what was I thinking? I have, I have no idea. And so maintainable code is good. So, one of my favorite things for abuse in Python is list comprehensions. Now, we all love a good list comprehension. They are fantastic. They often make more readable code. But this one here does not. So one of the wonderful features in Python of list comprehensions is that you can have two in clauses. See, for in, for in. Um, hands up if you know what this does. Perfectly valid Python in Python 2. Anyone know what this does? <laughs> What it does is it runs them as nested loops. This is what that really means. Now, this, for inner in nested, if len greater than two, for number in inner, append number. I can read this and go, OK, that is going through lists of numbers. And if there's more than two of them, it adds them to a bigger list of numbers. That, I have no idea. It takes me, I probably have to rewrite it as this to understand it. And there's so much code throughout all the code bases where it's not just list comprehensions. They're like, oh, we've thought of a really clever way to do all of this in three lines of code. I'm like, well, you could just do it in 10, and it'd be like much easier to read. Like, no, it's more efficient. Um, so and I, I used to be like this. I used to write the clever code that was unreadable and feel really smart and smug about myself. Um, but it turns out this is much better. Um, you will thank yourself later when you come to code like this. And, and part of this is that, like, as I've been saying to people I've met at the conference, it's about, I think part of being a scene developer is not about fixation. It's about exploring your options. It's about taking four or five different paths and not being afraid to throw them away. If I had an expression like this, it's probable that I've tried three or four different ways of writing it and just picked the one I think looks most readable. Um, some of the parts of South and Django migrations, some of the worst parts are the dependency management because with, Sang with Django and South migrations, you have on disk a set of files, and these files declare, OK, well, I depend on this file. And this file says, well, I depend on that file. 
And so well, I depend on both of these ones. And your job is to take all these files and work out a linear plan through them that satisfies all the dependencies. That is complicated code. You can do it in about three lines, but it's unreadable. And so part of the thing with that was making that in Django, that code is much more readable. It's commented. You can understand it. And you don't need to be me four years ago with like his flash of inspiration to understand what's going on. And it's, more true, it's true for more than just programming. Databases are an excellent example of this. If you are trying to handle a really complex storage problem, like you know, say you have, well, we have these five million different you know, points on a sphere for, like, of the Earth to try and do. We want to, we want to tell people they're closest 30 at any one time, but make sure they're at least less than a month old. Um, that's complex enough that you probably can't just think about it and work it out. It's much better to go and try, make, make some prototypes, make some quick stuff, and just try all the options. Like at work, we regularly just go, should we do this? And we go, well, and we just try three or four ways. And like, it takes a couple more days. It's a bit slower, sure. But at the end of the day, you have concrete results. You have this understanding. And often, you'll gain knowledge about not just the problem, but your underlying language. Part of how I've learned about Python is just understanding over time, as I've tried this stuff, well, it turns out, actually, in this case, that this is really slow. Why is that? Well, it turns out in C Python, function calls are really slow. But in PyPy, it's different. The memory usage is different. And you've got to remember, there is no perfect solution. If you're going into software engineering, trying to find, well, we have this wonderful problem space. And we're going to have the perfect software. And we're going to ship it perfectly. And we've done. And I can just go and relax on the beach somewhere. Um, you should go into computer science and become an academic, because that's not how software engineering works. Software engineering is about deadlines and costs and oh, we need, to, we need to scale this up quickly, and our users are doing the wrong thing, and that kind of stuff. If you're coming in expecting a perfect solution, you are perhaps a little bit misguided. Um, there are occasionally perfect solutions, and even those often aren't good enough. Um, one good example is pathfinding. So if you have a, a graph of nodes, and you want to find the shortest path, say you're in a game, you know, I have a map of a game. I want to make my character walk from here to here the shortest path. There is an optimal algorithm for that that finds you a guaranteed best path solution. It's quite slow. It's much better to have a, one that finds you a nearly good enough, so it's nearly perfect, but it runs 10, 15 times as fast. And on that regard as well, something I did a lot when I was a junior developer, and I've seen happen time and time again, is people going, well, this old system is terrible. We could just throw it all away and start afresh. It'd be so much better. And I've almost done this several times recently as well. There's that temptation to go, no, I know best. We can start from a, a clean slate, have a wonderful brand new project with beautiful architecture. It, that's a really bad idea. There's a reason the old code is ugly. It's because of a lot of edge cases you don't know about. The only case where I, I would say this is, this is fine is if you, wrote, if you wrote the entire old system in the first place. So an example of this is South. Now, South took seven years to develop. It became very ugly code in the end. And when I made Django migrations, I made the cho choice to almost completely rewrite it. It's about 90% new code. Now, I didn't make that choice lightly. I asked my friends and asked around and got some advice. But at the end of the day, I did know all the edge cases. And I, you know, I went through the old code. I found all the different reasons why it was ugly noted them down, and made sure with test cases, with manual checking, that my new one was as bad. And the new code is quite complicated. It's better. It's better architected. But it took many months to rewrite, and it's still not the cleanest code. Because at the end of the day, your problem isn't probably that clean. Another interesting thing, I think it's particularly prescient with Python and Django, is that backwards compatibility is much more valuable than you think. And this is kind of applicable to the Python 2 versus Python 3 problem. Now, five, six years ago, when Python 3 first came out, and I was uh, going to PyCons back then, and still quite, you know, like sort of, ah, oh, Python 3, it's a new exciting land. Um, the plan was that it would take, you know, five, 10 years to move over. But what's happened is that we've seen a much slower uptake than predicted. And I personally think that's because Python 3 broke backwards compatibility too much. It takes a lot of work to run Python 2 and 3 code on the same code base. Django does this. 
We have a library called Six that lets us do it, but it's, it's difficult. And there's just not enough the other side of the barrier. Like that Python 3 has no particularly great features out of the gate. It actually has got several many great features in it, but as somebody who's looking, you're looking at that precipice, you're looking and saying, well, there's a lot of work to get that side, and what's, what's, is it even worth it to get over there? That's one of the issues. By comparison, Django has always had this thing where we are backwards compatible. Like we have a very slow but steady release process. We haven't broken compatibility between releases ever. Even Django 2.0 will just be the one after 1.9. It's not going to be a big breaking change. And that has meant that people will naturally come through the upgrade process. And that's still difficult. There's still small breaking changes. But I think it's important to have that upgrade path. And that applies to more than just big projects like Django and Python that ship to many, many, many people. Even on your own code, like, you'll find that if you want to rewrite something, if, you're, if, like, if this is your temptation, what you really want is a slow, gradual migration with something like this. So as an example, at Eventbrite, we have code that works out what are the fees we charge organizers on a ticket. So say you buy a $10 ticket through us, we charge the organizer a service fee. Um, there's a fixed rate by default, but it varies based on agreements and stuff like that with organizers. The code that does that is incredibly complicated and hard to understand. I mean, also very inflexible. We can't vary it by region as we'd like to. You know, we'd like to have, well, in this part of the world, charge less payment fees and so on. And so we're rewriting that. It's not glamorous. It's not amazing. But we're rewriting it and keeping it back compatible. The new code drops into the same function shape as the old code. Because what we're doing is we're doing very slow progress. We go, well, OK, we'll update the middle engine first, and then we'll check. And, we, and we're doing this right now. We're running in production that new and old code. Every single ticket somebody buys in Eventbrite right now is being live checked for price between the two different systems. And we're seeing all the differences and checking that stuff out. And then eventually, we'll slowly replace the whole system completely over a period of probably about a year, I imagine, or perhaps a bit less than that. It's slow progress. We need to do that because we're a big site. I can't just go there and say, hey, guys, can you just turn off Eventbrite for like a few days? And then we'll just upgrade it all and come back again? Because that's, that's not going to work. So you've got to learn this sort of slow, steady progress. And it's good for everything, payment systems and other things. Another thing, and I re really recommend the keynote about this, is that nobody's a genius. You may think that all these luminaries of Python, all the speakers, People like myself who come up on this stage and talk to you in a manner like, like oh, yes, we're very important. We're not geniuses. We're all mediocre programmers. Um, I just happen to have written some software and been in the place at the right time. And that's why I do a lot. You know, I don't just know stuff. I'm not a genius. I sit down and have mistakes and talk through, talk through things with people. And everybody, in Django called us especially. Um, there's a great keynote on this by Jacob Captain Moss at PyCon this year in, in America, where he go, we reinforce this. Like, everyone is, you know, I, I am a mediocre programmer. Everybody is a mediocre programmer. And an important thing to realize is that geniuses are generally really hard to work with. Um, they're usually quite solitary and don't produce great code. Engineering is a collaborative effort. And not only that, it's a collaboration over code. I see a lot of people come into, come into companies or discussions, and they've learned Python, they've learned something else, perhaps, by themselves. And for the first time, you're in an environment where not only do you have other programmers to work with, but you have people with competing ideas. And often, they disagree with you. Now, disagreeing is healthy. Part of having good architecture is having a range of opinions and discussing stuff and coming to an agreeable conclusion. But a big mistake I see is people who argue over the theory. Like, well, no, in theory, this is way better. Um, or they go in like, with abstract concepts. And I've seen again and again that people get the wrong end of the stick, or they get confused, or what one person understands is very different from what another person understands, especially if people aren't speaking, if they're not both native English speakers. That can be a massive issue as well, because the meaning of work can vary by region. Like, you know, to an American, Biscuit is very different to what I, biscuit means to me, right? In America, a biscuit is a weird savory scone, um, whereas in the UK, a biscuit is a delicious thing like a digestive. Um, but that extends to a lot of stuff. And like, especially generic words like, oh, this is a platform, or this is a, you know, generic words get overloaded and understanding changes. So I really encourage you to, if you want to propose something, have a short code example. 
programmers, by their very nature, understand code very well. We all understand that sort of pure mathematical language, and it kind of crosses boundaries. Like, you can understand code written in Python by pretty much anyone with enough effort. And so when I'm proposing a new idea for Django, like I was doing recently, I, you know, I had this big proposal for Django. I'm trying to make Django have support for WebSockets and other kind of push stuff. I didn't make it public until I had a full repository of, well, this is actually how the code I'm proposing will work, and here's some example code, and here's like an example project of how it will work, because that's much more effective at giving ideas to people as well. Also, diagrams are really good. Um, if you have a whiteboard, or if you're, if you're remote working, if you have like a, a shared notepad on the internet and just draw diagrams, great way of debugging code. I heavily encourage that. But let's turn again to our fantastic time machine here from the wonderful movie Back to the Future. Um, and let's go, to the, let's go forwards in time. In particular, I want you to think about how long will the code you write last? How long will the data you store last? A lot of people here probably don't expect to be very long. Certainly, when I started, my very first professional programming job was the age of 16. That's now 11 years ago. That code is still running. That terrifies me, because I knew nothing back then. Um, and it probably keep running for another decade more. Uh, it's a management thing for an energy company in the Netherlands for some random reason. Um, but that's not even the worst example. Some, some projects will probably hit these two, like, you know, we don't know where we'll be in 100 or 1,000 years, but think about what you're storing. Like, this is part of the maintenance problem. Not only does your code have to be maintainable, it has to be future-proof, it has to be understandable. Like, someone has to come along five years from now and know what you're thinking 10 years from now. Even more, if you're storing data, if you're using some format you invented yourself that's very efficient but hard to read, what are the chances that that's be readable in the future? It's not even for the future. If I use a, say, say I invented a brand new serialization format, um, let's call it, I don't know, ASON, Andrew Serialized Object Notation. It's not JSON, it's some weird variant of it that isn't, isn't really compatible. I save in that because I think it's, you know, it, it, it like trims white space and encodes things better. Nothing else can read that. Like if we change language in five, 10 years to a different language, it's not going to have a compiler for this or a parser for this, whereas a standard format will have one of those. And so you're not just being future compatible with some mysterious archaeologist from a thousand years from now. It's also a practical thing. You're being compatible with different languages, different ideas. Like who knows what programming languages or paradigms will run in 20 years' time. Just think about that. As engineering as a whole is about being a little bit future-proof. And more than that, like who is accessing this stuff, right? Who is taking your code and modifying it? Like you should, exp and one of my favorite quotes is, you should program like everyone who reads your code after you is a psychopath with an, with an axe who, who knows where you live. Because you need to program in a way that makes the person who comes after you very, very happy. You need to be very, very clear, have great comments, because it's probably going to be you or somebody you, you work with, it maybe they're not be. Like, you've got to understand that code is not this fixed concept. You don't write it once and then stick it to a web server and it runs perfectly forever. Um, I think the longest I've run an unmodified piece of code is about five years, and that's really pushing it. Um, some things have been running for 30 or 40 years, like big mainframes especially, but there's still people who maintain that stuff. Like, it's not that the code needs to change, it's that the context, the world around it changes. The computers that do airline routing, for example, the airline routing ticketing system is very, very old. It's been the same for I think it's 30 or so years at least. Um, but the requirements around the airlines, the number of airlines, the way things work has changed over time. Like, you know, these days we charge extra for better seats and stuff like that, which they never used to do in, in the past. Um, the way ticketing works always changes. So you've got to anticipate that not only will the code need bug fixing, but your requirements are always changing. And again, like the format things, like what format is your software writing to, reading to? What's it talking? Like, how is it working? And even better is like, is your data even important? A lot of websites are very ephemeral, especially. Um, you know, think about like Facebook and Twitter status updates. Now, Twitter do have all of your tweets going back to whenever you started, which for me is like a good eight, or, well, seven or eight years, I guess, it's a while. 
Um, I don't really care about those. And in reality, they could probably just not have them. And this kind of feeds into one of the bigger things I think is important about product and engineering design, is that design of architecture of programs and data stores is explicitly tied into the product design. You can't expect to design a product, say an app or a website or something else, and then just have that so decide it, it's fixed in stone, push it down to the engineers, let them write it. That's a very, very poor way of doing software engineering because what happens is that you need to make compromises. And part of what I've been saying all this week to people is everything is a game about compromise. You have to compromise somewhere to make something else faster. So for example, in data store, if you can compromise on consistency, if, you're, if you are perfectly fine with things being different for a couple of minutes from different servers, you can get a lot more throughput and storage. And that's kind of the, part of the course of every part of product design. You know, a good company will have a design come down to engineering and we'll go, well, if we make that number like one decimal place less accurate, the whole thing will run 10 times faster. And if we don't show their picture but just their name, it's much faster. And that sort of, even the small changes can feed up and feed back through. Um, one good example is on Eventbrite, we're bring, bringing in di um, a new caching system for our event pages. Now, when you sell tickets, what happens is, say you're taking a, say you're taking a big event. So one of the biggest events is, interestingly, mine, the Minecraft convention. Really popular. Everyone loves Minecraft. Um, and so what happens is, literally like tens or hundreds of thousands of very excited teenagers and children hit refresh conti continually as it's about to come on sale. And your load just spikes to this giant level and then drops to the floor as soon as everything's sold. It's a very, very intense, like 10, 15 minutes of load. Now, our solution to that is a five second cache. Now, five seconds may sound stupid, right? Like who caches for five seconds? It's pointless. But if you think about, we have 5,000 requests over five seconds. If we have a five second cache, we've, we're doing 4,999 requests out of cache and one of them is out of the main backend. That is an incredibly high cache hit rate. And so on a site where that may not be as important, because you know, like we're we're very we're very localized. If there's like events are very specifically like firing off one after the other, it's not like a general load. Like Wikipedia is a much more general load. Like Wikipedia, there are popular pages, there are unpopular pages. News happens and things get more popular, but it's much more spread out. And also, you can cache for a lot longer. But part of that is like, well, the product people were like, you can't show the wrong numbers. We're like, it's five seconds, it's fine. And in fact, the five second number is is a compromise. Like we can. The more we push up the number of seconds of caching, the less load we have. But at the same time, the more out of date the numbers are on the ticket sales page. And at the end of the day, however long that is, is however long somebody could try and hit buy ticket and be told, nope, sorry, they've all gone. We, we lied to you. So that's why five minutes isn't good for enough, for example. So that's kind of why like, you, know, you should think about different parts of product. Like, is this thing I'm writing important, or can we lose it? Part of a good architecture is, well, We've written this thing, like we've written a search engine, but actually the site can run perfectly fine without the search engine. It's just a good extra thing to have. It makes things better, but losing it's not catastrophic. So understanding that, I think, is a very important part of, of feeding back through stuff. One of my favorite science fiction books, actually, has an excellent quote about this. So this, this is um, Werner Vinge's Zones of Thought series. And the rough context, which isn't very important, is the universe has different zones of thought and they can be far from one. But one of the fascinating things is it is set around 1,000, 2,000 years in the future. The human race is present. But one of the main characters in this book, Deep Into the Sky, his title is Programmer Architect. Because, and this is a very realistic future, what happened is we never actually stopped building abstractions and things. In, in this future, all the spaceships run on code that runs on code that runs on code and there's like this is there's thousands of years of accumulated things and right at the bottom is like a very old version of linux and like running like a unix and like you're running a unix timestamp and there's part of the book where it goes yeah, it's weird like we looked into the very core of the spaceship's code and the time is based on the number of seconds since the moon landing which it's not it's 70 but it's, it's very very close and so it's it's an interesting idea of like Part of being a programmer in, in that way is, is reusing programs. It's about, like, programmers don't write things from scratch. 
they dive in, understand existing code, and repurpose it. And that's kind of part of a good thing for even current programmers, right? Somebody's probably solved your problem elsewhere, and it's very tempting as a programmer to go, no, we're going to reinvent the wheel. I'm better than everybody else. Let's write it from scratch. That's a decent way of doing stuff, but at the same time, be very willing to go and find old code. Um, even inside your company, there may be stuff you can go and use, if not outside in the, in the open source world. But at the same time, don't try and... So that's called not invented here is a thing, right? Like people who don't like things they didn't write, it's called like, a, it's NIH is the acronym, it's not invented here. There is an opposite, which is it was invented here, where companies that do everything in their power to not have code that they've written, that's also bad. There's a, there's a fine balance between them. And that's kind of part of the, you know, engineering is collaborative. Like, your job is not to sit in a room by yourself forever and write code. If it is, get a new job, please. It's not, it's not great. Um, a good engineer will work with other people. They will talk about problems. They will try and argue it. Like, you know, if I have an idea for a solution and no one disagrees with me, I get very worried. I go and find more people until someone disagrees with me and then have a talk it through with them because nothing is without compromise. Every solution has its downsides and its upsides. And I think part of good engineering is working out what those are, having a good debate, and then going away knowing your failure. Like, know when it fails, know your downsides, know that kind of stuff. Make sure you sort of build software that is not only... It has to be both solid but also maintainable. And this is the thing, I call it build well, build good software. Don't compromise on time, but do compromise on time. It's always a balance. Take problems, look at the, pro look at the, the problem space. You'll always have external forces making you go faster. Like, you know, we need to do this cheaper, we need to do it faster. We need to do it with less people, with less servers. But your job as an engineer is not just to accept those requirements. Your job should be to discuss them. If a company comes to you and tells you, you must do this in this time frame, that's probably not great management. What they should be doing is coming to engineering as a whole and going, we want to do this, how long will it take? And then the engineers will, of course, have a nice long time scale and go, oh, it'll take three years. And then you have to debate, you have to push back and compromise. And like, well, if we make it less than perfect, because every engineer wants to build a perfect system, right? I would love nothing more than my job to be sitting in a hammock, just thinking of a perfect system occasionally writing one and then, you know, bringing some more tea and thinking more. That's not what we get paid for. And so just be aware that there's all these different things and there's compromise. And most importantly, know your downsides. If you're writing a system, you don't know how it fails, you don't know what the downsides are, you haven't done your research. You've just done half the research. You've done the good side. And everyone wants to know the good side, but know the bad. Um, just make sure you understand everything and I think that should be good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, for a few questions, I think. Or... A any questions quickly before we finish off? Yes. What are your personal opinions on MySQL? <laughs> <laughs> That's called trolling, that is. Um, MySQL is a perfectly fine key value store. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it. My. <laughs> MySQL is fine. It, it's, it's a good stepping stone to Postgres. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know I'm being a bit mean to that. It, it's, it's a lot better, actually. 5.6 has been proved things a lot better, but I still recommend Postgres heavily over that thing. It's kind of a random question. There we go. Any, any more? Cool. Thank you very much. Do what? you hate oh. space views in general? Oh, I did help write them, so I can't really say yes, can I? Um, one of the things about class-based views that's interesting is that the very first version of class-based views that I wrote um, with collaboration with somebody else was very explicit. It was very clean. There was single inheritance. And then through a process that was nobody's fault, that it was best of intentions, they became the complex web of dependencies they are today. And that's unfortunate. Um, I do personally not use them very often because I find them too complicated. I use the base view class because that's simple. It's like, well, you just write get, post, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I think they could do with some simpl simplification, personally. Yes? With 16 years of experience in software engineering, 
if you were to write a software to pilot the airplane, would you like to fly the airplane? How long do I have to write the software? So the, qu the question is, if I had to write the software to pilot the airplane, would I fly in it? Um, given that I am a pilot, there is a point where I trust myself less than the computer. That's quite a low bar, because I'm quite a low hours pilot. Um, but at the same time, like, there's a good reason that I think we won't have... Autopilots are very good for when things are going well. Like, you know, this is pilot so pilot training is about 20% flying the plane, and about 80% when things go wrong. You can fly a plane about 15 hours into when you've lost at learning to fly, but you can't handle engine failures, you can't handle high wind, you can't handle all the other issues. And so most of the training is, well, this thing goes bad. Like, okay, this instrument's failed, land the plane. This engine is stopped, land the plane. And so I'll be fine with autopilot when things are okay, but it's that ability to adapt to failure that I think we still haven't got to in computers yet. So one day we'll get there. But I'm not, I'm not a good programmer for avionics for sure, so let's not do that. Yes. Can you share a little bit more about the push feature in Django? I can a little bit, yeah. So um, the question is about the push feature in Django. Um, so as a, as a brief summary, uh, this, this is all very recent, I will point out. Um, the idea came, so the idea was three plane flights ago, which is about two weeks ago, on the flight back from Europe to San Francisco. Um, so I've had an idea for many years now to make Django more push oriented because Django is request response oriented, right? You have a request, Django has some code, it returns a response. Um, I wanted to change this to have sort of a more flexible event system where either a request comes in or a WebSocket message comes in or you save a model and all these can trigger code. And that's kind of the, the way it's been built. Um, it's not near final yet. So if you look on my blog, you'll see a big post explaining it with the pictures. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail before it's finalized, I guess. But it's, it's kind of like a, it took a lot of thinking. And I know that goes into my thing of like have working code because for, many, for a long time I had this wonderful idea and thought I was a genius. Um, but of course I'm not, as I've said before. And so I finally sat down, wrote some code, pushed it out for commentary and people to criticize. That, that's part of the process. So once that's done, and I'm hoping it'll be Django 1.9 or 2.0, we'll have much, something resembling push support in Django for WebSockets, for HTTP2 server sent events, that kind of stuff. But there's a, there's a whole talk there I'll give one day, hopefully. Yeah. Yes? Uh, you mentioned about writing good code and being like, more uh, you know, explicit than explicit. Yeah. So, actually, like, what, what's your opinion about using IDEs? Ah, so yeah, opinion about using IDEs. Um, so I use Sublime. Um, which has got, with some plugins, make it a little bit more better. Um, but that's for Python. So my other side project is writing uh, a game. And the game I'm writing is written in Unity, which uses C Sharp. Now, if you want a language that's really, really, really particular about how it runs, C Sharp is a great language for that. Um, it's better than Java, at least. So C Sharp is Java-ish. It has very strong typing. It has very explicit stuff. And it has a pretty good IDE. Um, it has Visual Studio or it has MonoDevelop. For those languages where typing and precision is very important. Like if you, there's so many ways you can make something wrong in C Sharp. You can like miss like one, co like if you put an extra comma at the end of a function definition, that's invalid because like there's no more there's no more arguments here. What are you doing? And it's, it's very particular like that. I think in that environment with strict typing where you have to match types exactly, match names exactly, IDs are very useful. I personally like a middle ground where I have the tab completion in Sublime and it does scan my other files for things. But at the same time, I also like to, because I mean, Python isn't autocompletable as easily as, say, Java or C Sharp is. Like, it's much more flexible. The typing is very dynamic. It's harder to do that kind of stuff. Um, and I think part of working with Python is understanding that you need a bit more runtime checks. You need a bit more, like, you know, throw in an is instance check occasionally. Like, what, if you have that else clause that you think you'll never get to, raise an error if you, if you think, like, raise error, you should never get here. Because one day you'll get there and see the error, I should never get here, and be like, huh? And then you'll get a trace back and be like, oh, that's how it worked. And so I think with IDEs, it's a, it's a balance. Like, IDEs in Python are fine. They're pretty great. Um, I would encourage people to not rely on them too much as a crutch. I've seen people rely on IDEs for like, it's almost like they're not programming they don't know the library as much, right? Like, it's, it's a good starter point, but you shouldn't rely on the IDE, like, knowing, like, oh, these are the things on strings, these are the things on integers. Like, 
part of being proficient in a language rather than being a good developer is knowing the language. Um, but at the same time, whatever you know, use whatever you like. If you want to use Vim, use Vim. If you want to use uh, IDE, use an IDE. It's not really a effect, I think, on how good your programming is. And I, I know people who are fantastic programmers who use everything from nano to like full on IDE. There's no, there's no real correlation there. Cool. Okay, thank you very much.